myself. So I hope everybody's doing great. I hope that you're excited for week two. Uh, I know that Kyle and I are, um, and uh, we're, let's just, you know, jump right in. So let me share my screen and flip my displays around a little bit. And we're gonna go ahead and get started, get right into it today. Uh, not gonna spend any real time on the beginning. You've, you've heard this before. Uh, just a quick introduction again, you know, Kyle and Zach, uh, we're really excited to be leading this program. If you're joining us for the first time, great. We're really happy to have you. If you came back from the first one, I'm really happy that we didn't scare you away already. So uh, welcome to the initiative. Uh, we really want to emphasize our goal every time that we start this. Our goal with this program is to teach others to code with the Tableau APIs and developer tools while fostering a safe and friendly environment for users at all scaled levels. Yeah. Did, did I don't you froze for me? I don't know if that was just for me or if that was for everyone. It's probably just you. We'll, okay. We'll talk it up to just you. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> uh, a little bit uh, of an update on the roadmap. This is one of the questions from part one is to just kind of talk about more that's coming down the pipeline and where we're going to go from here. So as you guys are aware, we're focusing on part one today and over the next couple of weeks and last week, uh, which is all about the REST API. Uh, we have kind of figured this out as far as the timing, the dates. Um, so part one is going to be going from last uh, two weeks ago, February 16th, all the way through April 13th. Uh, that's going to be comprised of five sessions. Um, those five sessions are right here. So the goal here is to teach you the fundamentals of programming, teach you the REST API, teach you all those kind of things. Um, and uh, we'll go through April 13th. Now, the plan here is between the main parts, so part one, two, three, four, we will take a little bit of a hiatus. Um, this one aligns to the fact that I'm having a baby. Uh, so I don't really don't, you know, I like you guys. I like talking about code, uh, but, you know, I, I got to be there for my new kids. So uh, we'll be out. Yeah, my my uh, my uh, my uh, expansion of my family is coming uh, very beginning of May. So probably at least through May, uh, we'll be out and then maybe somewhere in the beginning of June we'll return and we'll start focusing on the second set of, uh, of sessions. Um, before we jump into things, a couple of updates. Uh, one thing that we want to highlight during these sessions is any updates throughout the uh, Tableau developer program. Uh, one update that I'd have I'd have for you is that they just had their February 2022 uh, sprint demo. These are usually every month. Uh, if you signed up for the Tableau developer program at tableau.com slash developer, you should get these notifications and these invites. Um, right here, it shows you a little bit about what they talked through. So there is kind of a new data dev leader and evangelist, Kevin Glover. Uh, there's new updates to tab command, which is for server commands and updating your server and running some commands there that makes it more uh, homogenous with the REST API. Uh, there's the Hyper API as a data lake. So talking about how you can use the Hyper API to really do some really cool things. And then converting TD to Hyper. Uh, one of the big things that was a call out from there is Tableau is completely abandoning the TDE format at the beginning of 2023. So it will no longer be supported. So kind of the emphasis there is if you haven't flipped everything from TDE to Hyper, first, why haven't you? Because it's been like four years. Um, second, you got to go ahead and make that happen. Um, we also have a new site for the program. So datatheories.com slash Tableau coders. Uh, the emphasis here is that any supporting materials, the recordings once they're up, um, anything like that is going to be posted on that site. So if you ever need the slides, if you ever need the code itself, anything like that, it's always going to be placed on this website. So make sure to bookmark that page. Um, the answer is yes, it's recorded. So this is definitely the number one question that we're always asked. Um, probably gonna have this all over the place, but yes, these sessions are recorded. They're posted to Tableau's YouTube account, um, just like most of their user group sessions. So you can always find it there. Usually it takes something like four to five, sometimes seven days to get that recording up, uh, but it will definitely be up there just like it will be for this session as well. And finally, uh, we have a uh, dedicated uh, Slack group inside of the data dev channel. 
so that is right here. We gave a short link so that you could go to that and remember that. So I'll leave this up for a second, but the, the goal here is uh, this is our own little channel. So Kyle and I are already on there. They're, we're the only two. So you guys are probably joining now, hopefully. If not, we'll share these links afterwards. Uh, but this is a place where you can ask questions of Kyle and I. You can maybe check in on updates. You can ask questions about your learning and where we're going next and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can ask uh, really anything you want of us. So really excited to open up a new channel for you to communicate with us and talk with us, ask questions, all the, all the nine yards. All right, so let's do a quick recap of what we learned last week, or two weeks ago, rather. Uh, the biggest thing, and really the only highlight we're going to have, is that you should have these three things. Uh, we will continue to be using these. Uh, we've mentioned this several times. The most important thing from session one is that you have these three things downloaded. Postman, Visual Studio Code, and Python. And also that you establish yourself a site on the data dev um, uh, the, uh, site for Temple Online. Uh, so that's really about all we're gonna talk about from session one. We're gonna now go into Python. So I'm excited to say that, you know, last, last session, we didn't really focus too much on code itself. Uh, this time we're gonna actually start off with some coding. I'm really excited to go to that. So one thing I wanna emphasize is the why of Python. Um, before we jump into this. So Python is extremely popular. If you look at trends over time of software languages and programming languages, you're gonna see Python at the top pretty much all the time. Um, it's very easy to learn. It's considered one of the easiest languages to learn, if not the easiest. It is human readable. So unlike some things that you see, like maybe JavaScript, it's gonna look like actual human language. It's gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to read it. You're gonna be able to follow it. Even without a programming background, even without a lot of experience in Python, it's pretty easy to jump in and understand at least at a high level what is happening in the code. It's used for everything. Uh, this is, Python is used for automation. It's used for data science. It's used for websites and web integration. It's used for pretty much anything you can think of. I mean, this is used by kids even to create little, you know, robots and toys. It's very popular for things like that as well. Uh, it has a huge community. So you're gonna appreciate this coming from Tableau. Tableau has a huge, vibrant, excited community. The same can be said about Python. People love Python. People love to talk about it. You're never going to find, you know, a lack of information about Python. I guarantee any question you're ever going to have is answered out there somewhere. It's free. It's open source. So we don't have to pay for this. Nobody's monetizing off of Python. And it's used everywhere. You know, just a, a few notable companies there. But pretty much any, any application, any company, of any, any node is going to be using Python in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so let's code. So what we're gonna do now is open Visual Studio Code. Um, so I'll give you a second. If you're wanting to follow along, go ahead and open VS Code at this point. Hopefully you have that installed. If not, again, this will be recorded. You can always come back later if necessary. So we open VS Code and you're gonna probably have something that looks like this. Now, the first two things that I would say that you wanna do is install a couple extensions. Um, these just make VS Code work better with uh, Python specifically. So when you open VS Code, you'll see these icons on the left. Down towards the bottom, you'll see extensions. It's the second from the bottom. And when you open that, you'll have something like this. Now, you want two things here, and this is based on what Kyle just told me. So we're going to make sure that we listen to Kyle. And if anything breaks, it's completely uh, completely Kyle's fault. Uh, so the first one is Python. We want to go ahead and, and check that. And it's going to explain basically that this is an extension that makes Python work more friendly with VS Code. It's going to understand things like it's going to do some debugging for you. It's going to do some formatting, some things like that. Um, just to make sure that VS Code works well with it. So go ahead and click on that and install. If you see that, if you see uninstall, that means that you're good to go. Now, the other one that I am not so familiar with is PyLance. So Kyle, why don't you explain a little bit about what PyLance is? 
Sure. So pylance is what's um, config, uh, excuse me, considered a linter. Um, it kind of it, it uh, augments uh, what the official pylance, or excuse me, what the official pylance extension does. You can see there; these are both provided by Microsoft, so they're you know they're optimized to work with VS Code. Um, having them both installed just means you're going to get as much uh, help with uh, autocomplete, uh, filling in uh, methods and things like that. So uh, I usually install these, both of these, if I'm going to be working in Python as first thing, so that uh, VS Code helps me as much as I, as, I, as it can as I'm trying to code, so I don't have to remember everything. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Now, once you have those two installed, we can go ahead and start, uh, you know, a new page. We can go ahead and do a new file if you need to. Um, doesn't really matter as long as you've got these tabs at the top. And you might have it say something like this. This is completely fine where it says select a language. If you click that, you'll see it kind of bring this up. You can find Python in there, or you can also save it as a Python file. It doesn't really matter. If you start this, it's just going to understand that you're working with Python, and that's the point of this file. So let's go ahead and write some code. The first thing you're always ever going to do when you learn something with code uh, to do, let me close that. The first thing is usually hello world. Now, if you've ever done any sort of courses, if you've ever learned anything about code, it's always going to start with printing out the words hello code or hello world. So what we're going to do is for, tab for Tableau, for Python to print out a statement, it's pretty simple. You're going to start off with the word print. You're going to open up parentheses. And then in quotes, you're going to put the word here. Now you see some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, this is going to auto-complete some of the things. It's going to make some recommendations. It's going to tell you how you can construct these. You can ignore that, but it is useful to spend some time maybe learning about what you're seeing here. Now inside of this print, let's go ahead and say, hello world. We're good to go. We've got something here. Now we actually want to make it do something. So. To do that, you can hit F5. Um, and it might ask you to save this, which is fine. I'm just gonna save this as sample on my desktop, hit save. And then it might come up as well as ask you how you wanna run this. If, you, if it does, just click Python file. And then you're gonna see it kind of kick off here some of this might look a little bit different to you, um, but once it actually runs, you'll see it actually come back and say the response, which is what is being printed out there. Um, so a question from Andy, is VS Code an alternative to using Jupyter Notebooks generated with Anaconda? Uh, you can kind of think of it that way. The way that, you know, usually what I, the advantages of Jupyter, and we may at some point come back to talk about Jupyter is, you can basically save them as you know your own little file, your own little notebook. You could scratch code a lot. You can go through and run them, you know, one by one. But the end result is essentially the same. You're using, you know, kind of like an IDE. That's what this is to run your code in some in something else. Um, I like Jupyter specifically when I want to do things more with like uh, uh, data science. So if you ever want to export and show things as visuals with like Plotly or things like that, it does it very well in line and allows you to just run it like that. Yeah, um, and Zach, just to, just there's a couple other questions. Um, so Baradwaj, uh, PyCharm also will work. Anything that we're doing, um, that you see us doing, will work in any flavor of Python 3, uh, whichever IDE or editor you choose to use is totally fine. We just prefer VS Code because it is kind of language agnostic and it has a lot of built-in support for other features. But if you're already comfortable with some other IDE, as long as you're on Python 3, everything that we're doing should translate one-to-one. -one. And I did want to point out um, in Zach's example here, if you were on session one, I pointed out that uh, Mac, I believe, uh, is installed with versions of Python 2 by default. And you'll still see Python 2 out in the wild. If you are like Googling and you see examples of print statements that, that don't have parentheses like you see here, that means you're looking at a Python 2 example and you may not be able to translate it one-to-one. -one. So just if you're, if you're Googling, 
usually people will say this is Python 2 or this is Python 3, but just keep in mind that we are doing everything with Python 3 and there are very minor syntax differences. Yeah, good call out, Kyle. Yeah, there's definitely things, prints completely different um, and some other things that you'll notice. So, so good call out there. All right, so it looks like everybody else got their other uh, questions answered. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a variable. So we're just going to use a number and we're going to save that inside of our flow here. So um, we're just going to call this my number and we're going to say that my number equals five. Now you'll notice a couple things here. First thing is I'm using what is called camel case where I'm starting with a uh, lowercase in the first word, then I'm using uppercase with every the beginning of every other word going through that. So uh, the other thing is I'm- Can I burst um, your bubble for a second? Okay. Camel case is actually not the standard for Python. Snake case is the standard for Python. <laughs> So you'll notice as, as we go through this, Kyle is much more heavy into Python, um, but I'm also, again, his boss, so he can't correct, he's not allowed to correct me anymore. So, so I'm going to call it, so what would you do here, Kyle? Um, so, so just so everyone knows, this doesn't matter in terms of functionality of code, but yeah. in the Python community, the standard for naming a variable is what's called snake case. So each part of it is lowercase and separated by an underscore. So ideally, Zach would have my underscore number as the variable name. Again, this doesn't matter. And this is more just about like code standards. Not a big deal for right now, but I want to set you guys up right. I don't want Zach to lead you astray right from the jump. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to talk later, Kyle. All right, so we've got the uh, the snake case here, um, and, I, and I will also say this: I Kyle definitely does a lot more programming than I do, um, and I'm also a little bit behind. It's been a while since I really did a lot of programming. So um, back when I did it, it was usually camel case. Maybe that's changed. Maybe I just was doing it wrong, but that's fine. Either way, <laughs> if you're in JavaScript, you would have been totally right. So yeah. <laughs> And we'll just say that's what it was. So yeah. anyway, now that we've established a variable with the right naming convention, uh, we've established that it is the number five. Let's go ahead and double check that. So we're just going to print this and we're going to print uh, my number. And again, we'll just hit F5. And what do we think it's going to do? It's going to give us a hello world because we didn't stop from there, but it's also going to give us the five. So instead of just printing my number, it's understanding that we're giving a value to this variable. We're giving it the value of five, and that's what it's printing out here. So let's go um, do let's, let's add a little bit to this. So let's go ahead and create uh, my second number. And let's call give this the value of 15. We're going to do a little bit of arithmetic. So we want to, um, let's say, call something some math. And this is my second number minus my number. And you'll notice I'm just using, you know, it's popping up and actually uh, bringing some auto completes that I can use my arrows. and and tab through and do things like that. Now, if I go through and we just do the same thing, so let's uh, print some math and let's check what happens there. Again, hit, hitting F5. And you'll see hello word five, but then also 10. So 10 is some math and some math is my second number minus my number. So definitely, uh, you know, it's a lot that you can do here. You could make this division, you could make this multiplication, you could, you know, repeat these numbers, you could add a bunch of them. There's a lot of different options that you can do uh, with something with that. And let's flip over and talk a little bit about strings. So pretty much the same, same thing here. So we'll call this my string. And we're just going to call it, say, uh, Tableau coders is cool. Because it is cool. 
hit F5. And, oh, obviously I didn't print that. So my string and you know, let's start to simplify. Let's take some of this other stuff out so we don't see that. Uh, we'll hit F5. And we'll see table of voters is cool. So again, pretty simple stuff. Um, now, if we wanted to get maybe a little bit more complex, we can start to enhance the first thing. So what if we wanted to do my updated and what is my updated string? We'll just say that is my string, but I wanna trim this down. So a way that you can actually trim down the string is you just put these brackets and we're just gonna list actually what the, um, what the, the, the characters are. So we're starting at zero, typically in programming you start with zero. So this is zero, which is the T, to 21. And the only reason I know that is I've already looked at tablet coders is that's 21 characters. So if we then maybe add something to it and say, awesome. And then let's print my, update, oh, my updated string. Let's spell it right, updated. All right, and we'll go ahead and do the same thing, F5. You'll see that it's updated to say tablet coders is too awesome, because apparently I didn't write down the right, but the same kind of thing could be said. So we'll just take three off of this. It's really 18. I'll try it again. I don't know why I wrote down the wrong thing. Some good there. counting there, Zach. Very great counting. <laughs> All right, so we've got tablet coders is Awesome. All right. Last thing that I would say here is when you work through this, you can always comment your code. Um, so I can say, maybe probably put this above here and say, here is some text. Now, the, other, the last thing I'll say before I move over back to the presentation and then pass it to Kyle is there's a lot of really cool things you can do inside of Visual Studio. Um, when you work with, uh, you know, programming languages, you work with these IDEs, it's really good to just get a knack for like using the keyboard, try not to use your, your mouse. In fact, inside of the PowerPoint presentation, I did in the appendix put a list of keyboard shortcuts that are there. There's lots of cool things. So, for example, if you wanted to move a line, you can hold up, hold alt and move it up and down like this. You can say control G and go to like line four. Um, you can, you know, let's just say um, string. If I know that I want to find all of this, I can hit control D, control D again, control D again. And then I can say uh, my string word. And you actually see it's, it's updating all of them at the same time. Uh, last little thing, like you can even like hold you can um, put, hold Alt and click in multiple spots and say, this is some typing. So just a lot of little things that as you learn uh, VS Code, there's a lot of cool things you can do with it just to save you time, just get familiar with that. Um, last kind of page here is there was a couple things of, um, and there's a question, why is it doing CD each time? That CD is changed directory. That's just making sure that it's pointing to the location of your file. That's what it's doing every time that it runs that. Yeah, and um, I had started, sorry, Zach, just to jump in. I had started answering that question too. Um, it looks like Zach, by default, if you're on Windows, it's gonna set your integrated terminal to use PowerShell. Um, and PowerShell is a little goofy in how it prints out things when it's initializing. You can also use regular Windows, Command Shell, Bash, uh, any other terminal that you might have on Linux or Mac, um, it's all in the settings. So if you dive into the VS Code settings, you can you can specify what terminal you want to use if you're used to one flavor over another. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last thing, real quick, um, don't know the answer to the last question. I don't know if you do, Kyle. 
Um, I'm not sure, honestly. Zach do, does have in the appendix a VS Code keyboard shortcuts. I think list. it's only Windows. It, it is only Windows, but it has a link in it to other operating systems. So um, I would oh, probably I guide that. you there, only because I, I'm not a Mac user and Zach isn't either. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I've never. I think the last time I used a Mac was when I was a kid. So, <laughs> uh, so definitely take a look at that. The VS Code extensions. Last little thing is, uh, I know there was a question about like uh, what are some resources. I could plug a bunch of them. You know, there's different tools. Uh, there's different webinars things. I really like this book, Automate the Boring Stuff. Something I used a long time ago. Um, it is completely for beginners. It also takes you through how to automate things that you typically do, like moving files, working with Excel, things like that. And best of all, it's free. So if you go to automatetheboringstuff.com, you have, it's completely there for free. You can just go through chapter, chapter, read through it and things like that. So um, that's it for me. I'm going to pass it to Kyle and he's going to talk through APIs and Postman. Great. Thanks, Zach. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, as Zach kind of alluded to earlier, uh, I've had a very exciting last few hours with an emergency vet trip at 11 p.m. last night, but I'm excited to be here with all of you guys. So, and actually, I am sharing, not sharing the screen I wanted to share. Just one second here, let me switch this back. Presentation over here and share again. Thanks for your patience. Okay. So uh, moving on to uh, away from the very, very scratch the surface on Python. And I and thank you for those examples, Zach. And we would really encourage everyone to like do some Googling, figure out, uh, check out the resource there or the resource that I posted in the chat um, and really just start thinking about the kinds of things that you would like to use Python with or what kind of things are relevant to you, whether your personal hobbies or at work. Um, and you'll find examples of people who are doing that already. Um, you know, if not, if you have specific questions as you dive in, like Zach said, Feel free to engage us in the Slack channel. Um, you know, we're happy to answer questions there. Uh, that was a very, very high level overview. Um, so we expect that there to be more questions and we are going to continue to dig deeper and deeper with each session. So what I'm going to trans transition to now is back to some information about APIs. Uh, we, we did a really high level uh, peek into Postman in the first session, just kind of explaining what it does and how to get started with it. I want to go a little bit deeper and start getting into some actual API concepts. And then in the next session, we're going to take these two things, Python and these API concepts, and start using them together. And that's when we really start making the magic happen, is when we start programmatically making these requests. But just as a recap here from session one, so what is an API again? So if you remember, an API is an application programming interface, and we use the metaphor of it basically being the, the server between your table at a restaurant and the kitchen. The, the server takes information from you, passes it onto the kitchen, the kitchen does what they need to do, gives it back to the server, and the server delivers it to you. So that's, that's a really, I think, easy to follow along analogy for essentially what an API is doing. Uh, we talked about an API being restful in certain situations, uh, mostly being about HTTP. And we're going to talk about HTTP methods today so you have a little bit more understanding of what those are. And just a reminder, for now, we're going to be talking about the REST API. At some point, we will start talking about TSC, which is the Python library that Tableau provides to do some of the same things. Um, we may use those terms interchangeably at some point, but just remember uh, that's what we're referring to here. And so my next slide here that I thought was really funny, but Zach called me a nerd, is you download HTTP, and then people of a certain age will, will know what I'm referring to. <laughs> so moving on. Um, the why can't I sweat? Pick the next slide. Can you guys still hear me? Is something is my yeah. internet? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hold on. Let me do the unlock lock unlock trick again. There we go. Okay, so an intro to HTTP. So HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and it is one of the primary and oldest communications protocols used on the internet 
to connect you with pretty much everything you do in a browser, everything that you download, everything uh, that you see as you're out there is uh, using HTTP to some extent. Um, you don't have to know a whole lot about uh, the, the history and all the technical stuff here. Just know that if you're on the internet, you're probably using HTTP. And if you're doing anything secure at all, you're probably using HTTPS, which is just the encrypted version of the same thing. I wanna call out in the next slide, or sorry, in the next bullet here, that HTTP is what's called stateless, and don't worry about that term necessarily. But what that means, if you look at the diagram, is if I, as a user, make a request to an API, that API will take my request, send it to a database or an application, it does what it needs to do, it sends me a response, and then that's it. I'm no longer connected to that API. And that becomes important when we start talking about chaining actions together, when we get into Python making requests and we get into TSC doing things on Tableau server, it becomes important to just make sure that we think out. I want to make sure that everything I do does no more and no less than what I need it to because otherwise we start getting into really redundant things that can affect performance. So I kind of explained the metaphor uh, with the server analogy, but the graphic at the bottom there is essentially what I said, if you just replace client with table, REST API with server, database, or application uh, with kitchen, this is just kind of a more in-depth view of, of, of that analogy. So the next, the next slide here is, do you speak HTTP? And so what I mean by that is HTTP has different ways of talking to ser uh, that ser servers and clients can talk to each other. And in HTTP, these are called methods. Um, the protocol defines more than 10 of them, um, and I have them listed there. I have, a, I have a link to documentation on all of the methods. Don't let that worry you, though. The vast majority of your time is going to be spent with the two that I'm going to go over today, Git and Post. Um, and I work with APIs at work all day, every day, and these two make up probably 90 six, 97% of everything that I do. So we are gonna focus on those, but it is worth it to know that, you know, what is an options request? What is a head request? So if you guys are interested, definitely check out that link uh, for a little bit more information on the individual methods here. So to break down the two most basic ones that we're gonna send, spend the most amount of time with, get versus post, so these names are kind, they kind of clue you into what's going on. So a get request means that I am asking the server to give me something. I want to get something from the server. Hey, Kyle, there's a couple of people asking if you could maximize your presentation. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, oh, I don't, I don't do a lot. Uh, it's the... It's the bottom by your minus plus bottom right. Ah, there it is. Yeah, I, I don't do a lot of PowerPoint. Yeah. There we go. And then let me switch display settings. Come on. Swap presenter and slide view. Nope, that put it on the other screen. Uh, let me stop it and I'll share the other screen. Okay. Uh, the PowerPoint will be on the data theories website. Um, it'll be there probably um any minute probably right when we wrap up it'll be up there all right is it showing full screen now it just says kyle massey has started screen sharing how about this i'll share the screen for the slide yeah can you do that do that for me and i'll read from it sorry here i don't know Wh which slide are you it. on you're on i am on the http methods slide which i think is let me get out of here i got it you got it okay Share. Okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, what I was saying, so the get is I'm asking the server, I'm asking to get something from the server. Sounds pretty self-explanatory. It's used to retrieve data. You may, depending on the API, it may give you one thing. It may give, it may allow you to filter a list of things, just depending on how the API is set up. Um, and your browser is doing this all the time. When you're viewing web pages and things like that, downloading files, those are all get requests. Uh, so this is always happening in the background. 
A post request, uh, on the other hand, is you are sending something to the server and saying, I want you to perform an action based on what I'm sending you. Um, so uh, example would be adding a record to a database or at our, our more relevant scenario would be sending data to Tableau server and saying, I would like for you to refresh this data source. Uh, so those are just some examples. We'll go into, you know, as we get further into code, we'll talk more about Git versus Post and what those request bodies look like. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples in Postman here. I do want to call out. It's very important, and that's why I have this star here next to versus. Whenever you're working with an API, it's very important to read the API's documentation because sometimes something might seem like a Git request, like I want to get information about this thing, uh, but because of the way the application works, it may be a post. So internally, our own API that we use at Chase for some of our Tableau automation, we use post a lot because we need to send along tokens and things like that. And otherwise, you end up with URLs that are, that are a mile long. So it, it, these are generals, speaking generally about these things, but always refer to documentation when you can. Okay, we can go to the next slide, Zach. I think it might be time for some demoing. Oh, no, last thing. Uh, the last thing to call out here, and again, we will spend more time going over these things in depth, uh, but HTTP, HTTP requests also have what are called headers, and they're essentially metadata about the request that you're going to make. Uh, so you can be telling the server, I want you to respond in JSON or XML. Uh, here's some authentication information. Here's the format that I'm going to send you. Uh, those are all valid headers. And when we get into Postman, Postman also generates some headers on its own. Uh, so we'll talk about those. And actually, um, Zach, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? And actually, now I think it's time for me to share again. All right, let's do that. So I'm going to jump into my virtual machine from last time. Share view screen two. You see that, Zach? I'm sharing all. Yeah, all good. Okay. All good. All right. So from last time, guys, we have Postman. I have Postman already installed. So I'm going to go just go ahead and open that up, and we'll. This should be a fresh, clean install. There shouldn't be anything in here at all. Give a second here. Right before this, the Windows in my virtual machine decided to update. So this isn't surprising. Here we go. So when I land here, I, I kind of I kind of talked about this in the first session, but uh, Postman over the years that I've been using it has expanded their capabilities a lot. They they now support like virtual environments and creating mock APIs and all this really, really cool stuff that where is kind of beyond the scope of, of this. Um, but uh, the main thing we're going to look at here is the tab called collections. And then over here, we have sort of a tabbed view of uh, what's going on. And I can click on this little plus sign to create a new request. So right away, I see untitled request. I see a drop down here that lets me pick these familiar looking things that are those methods that I was just talking about. So in Postman, we specify what type of requests we're going to we're going to send right before we enter in the URL. Um, I also have sections here for parameters, authorization, headers that I was speaking of, um, body, and some other things that, that we can dive uh, deeper into in another session. But I have some example APIs here that I want to show you just so you can get started. Um, there's two links, and these will be in the index of the uh, presentation. Uh, one thing that I found really helpful when I was learning more about APIs is just finding some sample APIs that will let me do things. You know, maybe it's silly data, maybe it's data that's just interesting. So I've provided two links here. One is to a listing of open free APIs from Postman, and another one is uh, just totally actually free, no off needed APIs from a site called mixedanalytics.com. Um, feel free to use any or all of them, Google them, uh, you know, find, find whatever you need. Um, I, I just wanted to, I didn't want to start with something specific to Tableau. Uh, I wanted to give us a, a something that was a little bit more neutral. So I'm going to start with something that's called the dog API. And all of these API, or sorry, all of the requests in this API are gets. So I can, all I'm going to do here is put in this 
URL, set my request type to get, and for this specific API, that's all I need. And if we look at the if we look at the URL here, usually get requests will kind of clue you in to what they're doing. So I can see here slash API slash breeds slash list all. So when I hit send, hey Kyle, could you put that could you put that link in, in the chat? There's there's the ask uh, to follow along if you're able to. I unfortunately can't copy from the virtual machine. All right, to, that's fine. I can I can type it. Can you, yeah, you can get it from the slide. I think. <clears throat> so anyway, here so you can see that I sent a get request and it is giving me back a JSON response of all of the breeds that they have in their database for this API, as well as like you can see it breaks it down from Mastiff, Bull, English, Tibetan. Uh, so that's that's a, a very simple get request. Of, I can do another one here just from the same API, just as kind of an example of some of the things you can do. This is also just a plain get request. And this one returns to me API breeds image random. So this just sends me a random dog image. And look at that cute little boy. Look at that. Look at how cute that is. So that's just a very, very quick intro into a get request. I'm asking to, to get something from the server and the server sends it back. Um, there are going to be some other examples. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going just going to skip forward to post re request examples because I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. So this API that I found is really goofy. Um, but it's fun and it's called the Shout API. Um, and all of a sudden I'm having trouble clicking again. One second. Come on now. I gotta figure out if it's Zoom or what is doing this. I keep getting locked. There we go. Okay, so when I go back to Postman here with this post API, sorry, the cat's yelling at me. I hope you guys can hear him. Oh, we can hear him just by. Great. <laughs> so if I open up a new request here and go to post and then enter in a URL, a post, as I mentioned, is expecting me to send something to the server so that the server can interpret it and then take an action here. So in this case, I'm going to put this in the body of the request. And again, we'll get more into these different types when we start putting code and API requests together. But for this one, this is going to be a raw request, and this request is going to be in JSON. And what I'm going to give it here is I'm going to give it something called input, and I'm just going to say this is all in lowercase. And then when I send this to the shout API, what do we think it's going to do? It returns it all in uppercase. So this is just a really easy way of saying that I'm posting something to an API, it's doing something to, to or with the information that I sent it, and then it's sending it back. So last thing that I wanna give as an example um, that'll be really helpful when we start moving forward is how to save these requests. Cause I might wanna come back to these and use them again or tweak them or whichever. So when I'm inside a request, there's a little save button here. I can save it just like this. And it's asking me, I can give it a description. It'll by default just name itself the URL, but I can give it something more descriptive. Uh, what it's asking me to do here now is create a collection. And you can think of a collection as sort of like a, a folder uh, that can also have subfolders. So I'm just gonna name this my collection and click on create and save. And now you can see in my little navigator here, I have saved the request under this called my collection. And it even tells me real quick what kind of request it is. So if you have a collection that has several things in it, you can quickly glance and say, okay, I'm looking for the post with this name uh, and, and make, get, Postman helps you keep things organized there. You can also, one thing that I wanna make sure and show you guys because there will be a collection saved out in the bit bucket. You can also import collections that other people have made. And it's just as easy as clicking on this import button and upload files. And if I go to where I have a collection saved right here and I click on open, it will give me some name, some info about the collection, et cetera, et cetera. I click on import. And now I've got this Tableau Coders collection that has all these requests in it already. Um, the folder is not expanding. There we go. So that's how you make a very basic request in Postman. Like I said, the documentation to those APIs that I played with 
and the one and the Tableau API will all will all be in the appendix slides. Encourage you guys to play around and um, get a little bit more comfortable with Git versus Post and how to use Postman. Send us the question, any questions you have, because when we the next session, we're going to start taking these two theoretical things we've been talking about and putting them into one. And that's when things get really exciting. At least I think so. So that pretty much it covers what what I wanted to go through today. Um, so Zach, I think we have some some stuff to do, don't we? We got Q and A. Let's start with that. You go. Let's ahead. start with Q and A. Well, actually, sorry, sorry, sorry. We've got uh, gifts. We've got gifts, gifts and swag. So why don't you start with that real quick? Uh, go ahead and ask a question or two, and then I'll take it from there. Sure. So I for the first question will, and we'll take the first. Uh, answer. I'm going to stop sharing here so I can see the chat as well. Um, we will take the first person to answer correctly in the chat. So make sure you're using the chat and not the Q&A. Um, so first question for a little prize here. Tableau is abandoning the dot hyper format in 2023. True or false? Uh <laughs> Wow, we got a lot of responses. <laughs> People um, started typing before you even they finished did. the question. Um, I kind of say we give it to James because he was right. I mean, his, his answer is right. They're abandoning TDE. It's... That's your call. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll give it to James. Uh, I, I, James, James email. The, the important part was that he was listening. So <laughs> you're definitely listening. So James, uh, send us your email in the chat so we can get that over to you. All do you right. want me to do another one, Zach, or do you want to? Um, I'll do the next one. What is? I forgot. I I can't. You go ahead because I I lost our chat and I don't remember what you put. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so the next question that I had, and this is this is a Python question. Uh, that's the only hint I'll give you. So Zach did mention this. The first letter of a string is typically represented by what number? Ooh, Phil was, Phil had it real quick. Yeah, what's, yep, your, yep. what's your email? I like that uh, Goddess or Godis was just like pilots, just threw it, just threw it out there, just in case. <laughs> you guys are fun. Um, and I like, I did, I almost everyone said zero, that's great. Um, it, 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 it's one of those things you just kind of get used to when you get into coding. Zero is the first thing. <laughs> so, uh, all right. yeah, we're not going to talk. We're not going to. Um, we're not going to ask about the snake case because we've already, we we've already got that one. Everybody knows. I, I just want you guys to know that I I prepared that in advance. I was hoping that Kyle would call it out so you guys would know. Oh, right away. oh so, okay. Um, appreciate <laughs> appreciate uh, Kyle humoring me for that one. <laughs> Uh, what do we got? So those two get a gift card, but we've also got a 12 month subscription to uh, Tableau e-learning. What do we, we got to do a, a nice big question for that. We haven't even thought about this. So what do we do? What question do we have? Think of this. I think we need something from your postman stuff, Kyle. What was, what's a good question that was, it's a tough one. It's gotta be tough. Let's, let me see, let's see here. Um, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't know. Um, let's see. Well, oh, I, I mean, what, let's see. what about the, what about this? Uh, is there a call to the dog API you could, you could ask somebody to do that would give an answer in an image or something like that, that you, they'd have to tell you the answer. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. If anybody, I think the easiest one I could do, if anybody has the dog API, has been following along in Postman, give me the one, two, three, four, fifth result from the API breeds list all endpoint. We've got uh, Airedale, Labrador, Wolf, Japan Zeller. Uh, Doug, Doug got it. He added, I think he added a J by mistake, but that is the fifth result. The fifth response is, uh, is Oppenzeller. So we'll give it, we can give it to Doug. I was going to say, I've never heard of Joppenzeller, but I've also never heard of Oppenzeller. But <laughs> yeah, yeah we can, Doug, we'll, we'll call it Doug. So 
Doug, send Good us job. your email and we'll get that over to you. Yeah, great job. I'm, I'm really happy that everyone's following along. Yeah, awesome. there's a lot of people going through that. That's great, guys. So um, so we've got, the, make sure you put your email in there. Uh, Kyle, while I'm kind of wrapping up the last slides, can you make sure you got the free emails? Um, yeah, yep, yep. All right, so last couple things. Let me share my screen and then we'll open up for a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, over here. I'm going to leave it small just because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to mess with it. So uh, next session, we're going to continue on. We're going to go into some more Python. We're going to combine the two things. Like Kyle said, we're going to combine some Python and some uh, API calls and do that through Python. Talk a little bit about something called the Tableau Server Client. Uh, more fun, more prizes, all that kind of stuff. Um, the slides will be up probably later today. We'll put a chat ping back out into the, um, the Slack channel, just to let you know that it's out there. A uh, couple things in here. There is the uh, code that we went through. There's the VS Code shortcuts. There's also some examples of public APIs that Kyle's got out there. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it on this slide with the uh, Slack channel just in case you didn't get that. So if you do got to leave us, thank you again for joining. Thanks for being here, hopefully for your second session. Hope to see you next time. Uh, for everybody that has some, some questions, go ahead and throw them out there and uh, we will answer them. Thanks everybody. All right, so some Q and A. Uh, can automation using Tableau's REST API and Python replace Tableau's data management add-on? So uh, I don't there know, are some- it? <laughs> there, 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 there's some, so, so yeah, Kyle, why can you answer this? Huh? I can. Huh? Um, this is actually like my job. <laughs> this is actually what I do for uh, most of the day, most days. Um, yes. Now, it, there's a lot of variables to take into consideration. Like, for example, in Chase, we have all kinds of approval requirements that we're uh, handling but within our automation. So that part could be way more complicated than the Tableau part and often is. Um, but most of the things, most, I will say, that the data management add-on can do, you can find ways to automate with the REST API and with the Python library. Yeah, the only thing I would say is, um, because it's not specific in here, and that's kind of where I was leading you, Kyle, but you, you went the, probably the right direction with uh, the deployment stuff. Um, so there's multiple parts to the data management add-on. There is the deployment tool, the enterprise deployment tool, EDT. There's also the um, Tableau catalog features, um, which are just kind of a UI on top of the data management, uh, sorry, the data uh, catalog API. Um, and there's you know, there's other things like um, uh, the, uh, can't think of the word, virtual connections and uh, real level security options. So depending on which one you're talking about, uh, some of that can be automated. Some of it may be a little bit more trickier. Um, Kyle, I'll leave this one to you. Kyle, you said that you use the post method uh, is able to refresh data sources within Tableau. Would you please provide more details on how users can do this within a dashboard? Ooh, that's tricky. So um, that might be something that we could get to in a more advanced session. So, I mean, with things like uh, tab pie and things like that, you might, we might be able to look into things like that, but calling Python or API calls from a Tableau dashboard is definitely going to require some out of the box thinking um, that, you know, might be interesting to cover in another session, but um, yeah, keep that question until we dive in a little more advanced and I'd be happy to talk about that. This one also might be a little advanced, but this last question I see, what's an appropriate way to handle pagination or pagination when making API calls with Tableau? That's, that is, a, it is a little bit more of an advanced question and it's also a little bit hard to difficult, uh, sorry, it's a little bit difficult to answer without a use case, like being more familiar with your use case. Um, in our environment, even though it can be a little bit expensive, uh, there are times when we don't paginate at all, and we use the uh, either the AP, the REST API to give us all of the results, or in Python you can do a, what's called a TSC.pager. Now that, like I said, it is a more expensive call off the bat, but it also means that we don't have to guess when we're doing pagination. Um, so again, I mean, if you want to, maybe this is something that in a, in a later session, if you want to talk about this on the Slack channel, uh, we can connect, 
and talk about pagination because uh, we will definitely run into that when we start making calls. But that's a good question, definitely. I like that somebody said, Kyle, thank you for the second session. Hope your cat is okay, Kyle. Oh, thank, thank you, Jackie. No, he's fine. He just wants attention. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can Tableau consume multiple row data centers at one-to-one? -one? Uh, depends on what you're looking at. So, I mean, you can definitely, if you're just looking at regular data, you can connect to, you know, very large data sets, millions, sometimes even billions of records. Um, I, I need more context on what you're looking for. Anybody else? We got three minutes. Any other questions before we wrap up? Um, uh, could you help me, uh, let me know who sh we should reach out in case we need some help with installations of VS, Postman, Python. I would definitely subscribe to, uh, this channel, uh, this, uh, Tableau Coders. I, oops, uh, we'll be in there. We'll be able to help with the questions you guys have as you get to learn these things. And as we go through the curriculum, uh, definitely want to build that up as a place that, uh, we are in there. We're talking to, about things, we're answering questions. So definitely get in there and let us know if you have questions. So, okay, so the next question, uh, how do the metadata, metadata API and the REST API differ? Um, so there are there is some overlap there. You can get some metadata about workbooks, data sources, things like that using the REST API, uh, but it doesn't go as deep as, as the metadata, metadata API, which is designed specifically to give you that metadata and not the rest of the stuff that the, the rest of the stuff that the rest API gives you that wasn't confusing. Um, we will dive into the metadata API in, in another part of the series. And I think it'll become more clear than why you would use that over the rest API, depending on what you want to do. Will the new MFA with Tableau online interfere with API requests? That's a good question. Zach, do you, do you know, did they talk about this in the sprint demo at all? I haven't, I knew this was coming, but I haven't looked that far into it yet. No, I've seen it as well, but I haven't really seen how it's going to work with, the, with API requests and things like that. So um, that would be a good one. I'll, I'll see if I can get an answer to that, Bill, and see if I, if I do, I'll post the answer out into the <clears throat> Tableau Coders uh, channel on Slack. My guess would be if you have MFA enabled, you have to use a PAT, but that will will Zach or I will confirm that. Uh, can we okay. pull a dashboard links from the server? I, I'm not a hundred percent sure what we meant here. If we're talking about like links in terms of things, content from a dashboard, the content that's in a dashboard. Yes, there are ways to pull that, and we'll talk about that more uh, when we get into some more advanced REST API, and depending on what you mean, it, that might also, I guess, maybe could be in the metadata API, uh, but may, keep that question in your mind, and we'll, we'll come back to it when we're, when we're talking about those things a little bit more. I, my assumption is they might get a list of all workbooks in their URLs. Um, oh, if that is the question, then definitely, yes, yeah. and, we, and that's something we'll cover. Oh, okay, good. Thanks, Zach. Yes, Tushar, that, that is definitely something that we can do. And it'll probably be with, within the first group of calls that we make when we start making API requests in Python. Okay, awesome. Well, we do got to wrap where we got to stop right on the hour. So thanks again, everybody. Appreciate your time and hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.